You should have heard of King Leopold II. In the 19th century, a European king named Leopold II colonized Central Africa. He called this the Congo Free State. But it was anything but free. Leopold ruled the Congo with an iron fist, extracting resources from the native people at gunpoint. Millions of Congolese died from murder, diseases, and starvation as a result of his reign. But how did Leopold get away with this for so long? Two decades is a long time to be murdering people. Why did no nation try stopping him? I mean, there was evidence, pictures of human hands being chopped off and thrown into the river. And how did the Congo finally escape his grip? In this video, we are going to explore the dark history of the Congo Free State. We will learn about how Leopold came to power, how he ruled the Congo, and how he finally left the country. But be warned, this is not a story for the faint of heart. The Congo Free State was a place of unimaginable horrors. The things that happened there will make your blood run cold. So, if you are ready for this journey into the dark then sit back relax this is the unfiltered story of the congo free state so let's start from the beginning leopold ii was a king in europe he was a king of belgium a tiny country in europe so how did he find out about the congo i mean congo was at the heart of africa and back then there were no cell phones or internet so how did he find out about this place before every other person you would see as the story goes on that a lot of things that happened in this story were by chance and if one of these events did not happen maybe the deaths of millions of congolese would have been avoided so this story started from a missing person report david livingstone david was this explorer he was exploring Africa, going along the Nile, and he went missing. Back then, there were no mobile phones, GPS, something to track someone by. So when somebody goes on a journey, the only way to find out if they are all right is when the person writes back to you. You have to wait for their letters. And he journeyed to Africa through the sea, and he was writing back to give updates on his exploration in Africa until the letters stopped. And people got worried. This brings us to the part of the story where I introduce you to Henry Morton Stanley. Stanley was not as popular as David Livingstone, but he was an upcoming explorer. So, a newspaper sponsored his trip to Africa to come and search for David Livingstone. You might wonder why a newspaper would sponsor an explorer to come and look for a missing explorer. But that was an effective way to be the first to get the news back in those days by sending Henry Morton Stanley to Africa to look for David Livingstone if Stanley finds David the newspaper will be the first to know and they will be the first to break the news which was the incentive for sponsoring his trip to Africa now since you know how this works you should understand that Stanley has to be writing letters back to update his sponsors the paper of what he was witnessing in Africa what he was discovering what he was saying by then, we already have the Portuguese, the French, and the British in Africa doing some sort of trade. If you ask, they will tell you they were trading goods. But um, because of what happened in the following 20 years in Congo, we should have an idea of what business they were doing there. So, Henry was writing letters back to his sponsors, telling them of his adventures and journey through Africa. They were publishing the papers and they were making money because people were buying these new stories about savages in Africa, the business of other European nations in Africa. And it was quite interesting, especially because a lot of people were waiting for the news on David Livingstone. And eventually, Stanley found him. When he found him, he was sick. And because he has been sick, he could not write letters back home. So Stanley and David journeyed back to America. And that was the end of the story. His sponsors were excited. The news was out there. David Livingstone was found, and right here should be where the story ended. It should have ended there. Everybody was happy. They found the man they were looking for. Everyone goes back to their land, but unfortunately, these chains of events were just the start of the horrors that were about to happen. Now we have Leopold II. He wanted to be seen as this important ruler in Europe. He wanted to be respected, but um, because his land, his kingdom, Belgium was not that big, he felt intimidated by neighboring Germany. 
he felt intimidated by the French, he felt intimidated by the English. And when he looked closely at what these guys he was jealous of have in common, they had massive land. Leopold saw that if he had control over more land, he would be respected, just like having a nuclear power in today's time. But you cannot just wake up and decide you want more land. You have to go out there and grab it, conquer the land, and make it yours. But this was not easy because most of Europe were armed to the teeth. Almost everyone had the same advancement in weapons. So the only other place you could go to to try and conquer land was Asia, South America, and Africa. You see where this is going. So Leopold II, this man was so obsessed about getting a colony for himself, getting more land under his roof. Remember that when Stanley was looking for David Livingstone, he was writing letters back to his paper and they were publishing them. These stories about unclaimed land, beautiful soils that go anything, rivers that cut through mountains. And it was obvious that if Leopold wanted to get land, if Leopold wanted to conquer land, his best chance would be in Africa. Because there was this chance that he could find a place where he could conquer in Africa. And so Leopold started writing Stanley. And when Stanley got back from Africa, Leopold sent for him, asked him to come to Belgium. They need to have a meeting. He was going to pay for his trip. He was going to pay him a retainer fee. Just come over to Belgium. I need to talk to you. This is a matter of life and death. And of course, Stanley accepted the offer. This was a chance for him to make more money. So they had their meeting. And Leopold told Stanley that you are going back to Africa. Stanley, you have to go back to Africa. But this time, you are not looking for a missing person. You are looking for a missing land. Land that I want. I'm sending you back to Africa to go and find me an unclaimed land and I'll pay you handsomely. Tell me how much you need for a boat. Tell me the number of men you need. Tell me the supplies you need. You're going back to Africa to find me land. And Stanley talked about it for a few minutes and accepted. He was going back to Africa. He was going back to the land of savages. Now, although Leopold was the king of Belgium, Belgium had a structure of government where the king cannot just spend the country's money the way it felt like. He needed approvals from the parliament. There was a parliamentary system where the citizens' interest was protected. So he had to be creative on how he was going to carry out this project of his. Unlike the French, the Germans, and the English, that the government itself was going out there to colonize land, this was going to be Leopold's personal project. And he did not mind at all. He wanted the project for himself. So Leopold created these shell companies that were going to sponsor the trip on his behalf. And obviously, there were a lot of people that owed the king a favor or that want to be on the king's good books. And this worked. That was how Leopold got funds. He actually got over 30 million francs from the Belgian government. He was the king. He loaned that money from the government and he was going to pay them back. And as I told you earlier that a lot of things needed to happen for this story to turn out the way it did, this was when the steamship market was booming. Prior to them, people used sailing boats, you know, sails with the wind and uh, paddles determining the speed at which you get your destination. But with steamboats, it is an engine that uses heat to generate power and you get from point A to point Z in a shorter amount of time in spite of the weather. So he got this new toy for Stanley. Stanley went on to hire a few men and they headed out to Africa. Stanley's plan was very simple. He was going to follow the Congo River to determine its source. He figured this massive river is coming from somewhere. If I follow this river, I would discover more land. It is the most effective way of traveling to Africa. Instead of going by land through the jungles, facing wild animals and traps set by the locals. Stanley did what Leopold instructed him to do. As he was sailing through the Congo River, he was coming across villages and interacting with them. Now, Stanley did not just go with the new boats. He went with new weapons. Some of these local tribes had guns already. A few of them had the early guns that they traded with Europeans like the Portuguese. But the downside to a weapon like that that relied heavily on gunpowder was that when it was raining, which was common in the Congo, those guns were almost useless. But Stanley was going with an upgrade. Stanley was going with newly developed weapons, the magazine gun. And all his men were armed to the tooth with the latest guns. So no strange savages were going to scare these guys. And Stanley and his men were having fun. They were testing out the accuracy of these new guns, shooting at 
locals they saw along the river banks so when they find a sizable village they disembark and approach the rulers there it was more one-sided though where we had the big guns and um, we are trying to make peace with you and you know what happens if you don't agree to our terms you could try using your spears arrows and matchets on us but we have these new toys that could clear every one of the people in minutes so you have to work with us don't worry don't worry we are sent by this wonderful godly king from europe the king of belgium and he wants to help you he wants to help your people so here's this contract you sign here here and here whereby you ask for the king's protection don't worry i have an interpreter here that understands your language and he's going to interpret whatever is on this letter and obviously there was an interpreter that will read through it and say this is what this letter is saying sign here sign here and we have business but you might wonder why this chief should sign anyways you are all doing fine before stanley and his men came around but no that's not true remember i told you that the europeans were already in africa as at then so a number of tribes had interacted with the portuguese the french and the english they've exchanged slaves for weapons and these tribes were fighting among each other for possession of land some were fighting to defend their land some were fighting to conquer more lands and you know in africa there's always a story that somebody used to own the land you were on before you owned it so the person's great grandchildren would grow up to come and fight you to get back their father's land and when they conquer that land your great grandchildren would grow up to fight them to conquer that land there's this unending loop of who actually owns what land and the arrival of stanley and his men and the assurance of the king's protection for these tribes was very welcomed these tribes figured that we don't mind if this white-skinned men who had these unworldly weapons help us if we're on the side then we should be fine right that's what they're telling us that we'll be fine if we're on the side and these village chiefs and kings have to decide whether they should oppose stanley and his men or accept their help and just sign off this protection and Stanley's interpreters and translators told these kings that what was written on this contract was that they will be protected and in return the king would trade their goods um, raw materials for good money while protecting them he just needs access to trade with them maybe they'll give him one small land there maybe they should name a river after him nothing too serious and it worked for some chiefs Stanley was gradually getting different chiefs in different banks of the river different villages to sign these contracts accepting king's leopold's protection accepting a contract between them and they were making ground and a few tribes that were skeptical did not sign it and unfortunately for them stanley's men mistakenly leveled their village with their new tools and they made sure they left a few survivors to spread the news to neighboring villages that these white men were coming they were coming to help you out they were coming to protect you but if you annoy them they will come with fire and you your family your kids your parents might not survive it so the locals were spreading this news that the white man was coming you either fall in line or you are destroyed you and your people are completely wiped out and eventually stanley was able to get a number of key strategic tribes around this massive land area to sign the contract he was able to get them on the side of king leopold they had signed these contracts these contracts that was interpreted to them by stanley's men and stanley sent these contracts back to king leopold here king these tribes are happy to accept your reign these tribes are begging you to protect them to be their ruler now having all these contracts it was not enough to declare that these lands in africa belong to king leopold the french were much more powerful they could just ignore the contract and decide to claim the lands for themselves draw up new contracts with these chiefs and kick him out so king leopold needed other countries to acknowledge to accept these contracts as valid and to recognize this land as king leopold's property as belgium's humanitarian property that king leopold was pushing so he got to work the first country he targeted for their support was the united states he believed if he had their support he would eventually be able to get the support of germany then the french so leopold ii sent men to america to start carrying out public relations to start letting a few people that would appreciate what he was trying to do um, in the loop and of course it was sensible that he was interested in 
American lawmakers, if you could get enough of them on board, if you could get the powerful ones on board, he could get the president of America to acknowledge Congo as his colony. Now, why would America want to do that? Why would they want to acknowledge this land in Africa that does not belong to them for someone else? What could persuade them? What could push them to the angle? And as it happened, he didn't need to do much work. There's this senator, John Tyler Morgan of Alabama, and Senator John was having issues in America. He felt that free black men would eventually become a problem for America in the future. And in order to protect America, they should send black people back to Africa. But he could not figure out an effective way, an effective scheme to present that would encourage everyone to move in black Americans back to Africa. Since most of them were calling themselves free men now and they were no longer slaves, they were no longer of use, they should go back to their country, they should go back to where they came from. So, Leopold's approach was communicating to men like Senator John Tyler Morgan of this paradise he was building in Africa, this massive land, the Congo Free State, where they can send free black men back to Africa. And they assured these senators that, don't worry, they are not sending them back to the jungle. They are not sending them back to the wild. I am developing this wonderful paradise, this land that every black man will be proud of and will happily go back. It will definitely solve your problem. I'm a wonderful king and I'm here to help. And senators like John Tyler Morgan of Alabama had this proposal and were on board. They were like, okay, that makes sense. But that was just a few senators. You need more senators on board. So, Leopold II proposed that in addition to having a land where the blacks can be sent back to, he was going to grant America free trade in the region. And so, he was able to get enough influence. And the US was the first to acknowledge that Congo was the colony of the King of Belgium. So, now that Leopold had the Americans on board, he went to Germany and it was easy interacting with neighboring Germany. He had German blood. For the Germans, they were not that interested in that part of Africa. They had their own interests. But they figured that if this massive portion of Africa goes to Belgium, goes to King Leopold II, it means more land that does not belong to the French. It means more land that does not belong to the Portuguese. It means more land that does not belong to the English. So since it was going to someone that is not their major rival, they were fine with it. So we now have two countries that acknowledge Congo as Leopold II's colony. But Leopold figured that he still needed the French or the English to acknowledge this land for him. These are the two giants in Africa. If you could get one of them on board, then everyone is on board. And the French were beginning to look into Congo. They were beginning to approach just villages that Leopold had gotten their signature. So, Leopold offered the French free trade in the region, but that was not enough. He told the French that he was going to carry out this project to run rail tracks that would allow easy transportation within Central Africa. This was a massive project and required a lot of money. So, Leopold gave the French the first right of refusal, which is more like, if I get bored with this project, if I'm not interested in Africa anymore, if I need to sell this land, you, the French, will be the first person I would offer this land to before any other person. I will literally hand this land over to you if this project is too much for me. And the French were initially not interested in that. They could just take the land anyways. But they thought about it that this guy was going to carry out a project of running the rail tracks through this country, through Central Africa. This is a massive amount of cash that is required. So we are pretty sure that this guy is going to go bankrupt. We are 100% sure that he cannot complete this. It's, it's, it's impossible. He's going to run out of cash. And when he runs out of cash, we would simply just take the land. He would have done most of the work. So let's just give him a few years and he will be on his knees. And that was it. That was how Leopold got the seal of approval from the world that he, the king of Belgium, now owns the entire Congo. Congo was more than 77 times larger than Belgium, but it was not a problem. No one cared. Remember I told you he got 32 million francs from the Belgium government as a loan for this project. He was also using bonds to generate funds for this project. A bond is like a paper giving you rights to something. Let's say I need funds for something. I am not liquid. I don't have the cash on hand. I could issue a bond to you. So this is how it works. I would give you a certificate worth $100. You give me $100 in cash and I will hand you over this certificate. Now this bond certificate will say in 5, 10, 
15, 30, 100 years, I would pay you back this hundred dollars that you gave me. I'll take back my paper, my certificate, and I'll give you back your cash. But as an incentive, every year before the final year that I repay you back your money, I would give you interest. I would give you 10% of the value of the certificate you got for me. So if you gave me hundred dollars and we agree on 10% over 10 years, after every 12 months, I would give you $10 and I'll do that yearly for 10 years before I finally return your full hundred dollars now this is good investment for you over there because in 10 years you've made a hundred dollars and you still have your original 100 dollars you just have to wait me on the other hand i get the hundred dollars now today to carry out whatever project i want build up a business and i'll be paying you 10 percent of what you loaned me yearly this system has been in existence since then and is still in existence till now so leopold was issuing bonds to people and getting cash in hand to carry out his projects in Congo. Now that he has his funds, he will just take that money and go and buy cheap products in Africa and export them to Europe, reselling them for a higher value and make a good margin. That makes so much sense, right? And that should have been what happened. But that was not what happened. That was far from what happened. Leopold II saw that as being ridiculous. So he took some of the funds and got mercenaries, well armed mercenaries ex military from Belgium, but not only Belgium, from the whole of Europe, from the entire world. If you need to make some money and you had military experience, come to my steamboat, I will take you to Africa and I'm going to pay you a competitive salary. So he got administrators from Belgium and those administrators went with the mercenaries to take Congo with all the force imaginable. Now, to use a foreign force to take over a foreign land was not that easy. Your foreign forces is not familiar with the territory. They are not familiar with the terrain. So although they might have advanced weaponry, they would find it hard to take over an entire nation. And the number of Congo tribes were very dominating. They were very strong. Yes, they might not have advanced weapons, but you are no longer sailing on boats and just going by the river. You are coming inland, walking through the dark, dense forest. These guys will crush you no matter how much bullets you have. So Leopold was going to conquer the country in phases. So his mercenaries started with small villages, villages by the Congo River. They simply walk into the village, tell the leader of the village that the king of Belgium, who now owns the entire Congo, wants their goats, wants their cattle, wants their farmland, wants everything they have for free. He's their king and they were to submit everything they had to him. And of course, these Africans were not buying that. That sounds ridiculous. Are you serious? But there's so much resistance you can put up against a mercenary that came from Europe with advanced tools who has been on the sea for a few weeks, disorientated, irritated, angry about this unfamiliar scorching sun. So it does not take much for the entire village to be annihilated, for everybody to be gone down. And of course, news of this was spreading. Other villages were finding out that when the white man comes to you and asks for everything you have, if you do not give him, he's going to murder everybody. And a few of these villages started to comply. And these mercenaries were also recruiting Congolese people. They needed the locals on the side to locate hidden and secret tribes in strategic areas in the mountains, in the jungle. They needed insiders. And you might wonder why the Congolese people will work with this very aggressive, violent foreigner sitting in Belgium, imposing his rule on them. But you need to understand, <laughs> things were not easy back then. You need to understand that tribes were already having rivalries then. And these mercenaries will just go and approach the rival tribe, recruit people so that they attack the other rival tribe, and back and forth. And one of the Congolese that worked for Leopold's mercenaries, when he was interviewed, said, It is better to be on the side of the hunter than to be on the side of the hunted. When you are facing an opponent with such deadly weapon, you have to choose a side. One for your survival, for the survival of your loved ones. If you have kids, your children your family, your parents, or you take your chance, maybe you might escape. Maybe everyone in your family might escape. But just know your friend, your neighbor, someone close to you might join the other side and they can only give them the information that they know. And that information is your whereabouts or where you might go to. So it was not surprising that the number of locals joining Leopold II's mercenary were beginning to increase. And the timing of this was very key for Leopold II. Because some of the European mercenaries he got were free to stand up the next day and fly back to Europe. If they get malaria, if they get tuberculosis, if they are bitten by a fly, if they are not comfortable, if they are tired of what we are seeing in Congo, they just simply board a steamship and away they go. But as his local forces were growing, 
he was relying less and less on European mercenaries. And he does not have to pay the local mercenaries that much money. His mercenaries were called Force Public. Now they had local mercenaries who understand the terrain. They were going deeper into the African jungle, deeper into the Congo mountains to conquer the people there, to claim the land. The Congolese had formidable tribes who fought back. The Yaka people fought the mercenaries for more than 10 years before eventually they were crushed. The Jokwe fought Leopold's mercenaries for 20 years. The Boa and Buja mobilized more than 5,000 men to fight deep within the rainforest. The Sangha people also fought back. A Sangha chief and his men revolted and were cornered into a cave. The first public put fires at the cave entrance, blocking it for three months without going in. When they finally got their courage to go in, they found 178 bodies. Now, out of fear of this story going out and inspiring other Congolese to fight back, they did not want anybody to find out what happened to the Sangha people. So they got drums of gunpowder, set it at the entrance and detonated it, bringing down the cave on the bodies, hiding it forever. There was also this huge demand for elephant tox, ivory, and Congo had a lot of it. So. The first public were going from village to village asking for ivory and if the leader and his villagers do not have enough ivory that satisfied the first public, they would kill a few women and children as punishment. Next time they come back, make sure you have enough ivory. And such ruthless transaction was going on. But, but, that is not even the worst of what happened. That was just the beginning. Around that time, this European named Dunlop just discovered that rubber could be used to make tires for bicycles. These tires were very durable and very effective. So, an entire industry was born. The rubber industry exploded. There was so much global demand for rubber. Now, Congo was blessed with millions of rubber trees. And when Leopold discovered this, he demanded that his administrators in Congo start exporting all the rubber sap they could find and send them over to him in Europe. So, what did the first public do with this information, with this instruction? They announced to all the villages they had control over that the men must go into the bush to cultivate rubber and each village must deliver a certain quantity of rubber each week. So, young men have to go into the bush, climb these very tall trees and start to cultivate rubber. And this was not an easy task. One missionary mentioned in that journal that they found this man who fell from a tree and broke his back while trying to cultivate rubber. He was lying there in pains. Nobody was able to figure out how to fix a broken back. And he laid there in agony till he died. But the first public did worse than that because they were killing a lot of men, cutting a lot of hands, and their labor force began to drop. Leopold was demanding for more rubber to come to Belgium. And these mercenaries needed a way to punish these guys so that the harvesting of rubber would keep up to the demand. So they came up with this evil creative option whereby they kidnap women and children belonging to these men and they hold them hostage. Now, in order to get the release of your wife, your mother, your sister, or your child, you have to bring a certain amount of rubber. In some of these prisons, they would not feed the family. So the earlier you get enough rubber, the earlier your family get fed. Women and children were dying in these prisons out of hunger. And other camps, other prisons that fed their prisoners came up with their punishments with a bit of creativity. When the man does not provide enough rubber or he's late, they chop off the hands of the wife, the mother, the sister, or the child. This is a picture of a man who received as punishment the hands of his wife and child. Do you have an idea what that does to a person? These guys were broken. And Leopold II was getting his rubber. He was getting his ivory. He was making so much money. Now, you might wonder how no one knew about this. It is impossible. All these atrocities were going on for two decades. And how did no one find out about this? These people were living through hell and nobody was coming to save them. You might think that because this was the late 1800s and early 1900s, this news was not going out. But that was not true. The news went out. There was this black American, George Washington Williams. When he heard of the Congo, he was very interested. He figured he could actually go to the Congo and work there and maybe more African Americans can relocate back to the Congo, find work and even start a life there. He had this dream, this belief that instead of living in the US as a second class human, he can go to the Congo and live as an African with his fellow black skinned men and live as an equal with everybody around him. So he was very much interested. So he wrote to Lippo II, telling him he was excited about the project there in Congo and he was going to go and visit it 
write articles and news about it, inviting other blacks across the world about this new land that flowed with milk and honey. And Leopold II read the letter and was like, no, 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 do not go. Just don't bother. It's not conducive now. Wait for another five years, then you're welcome to come. I will personally fund your trip to the Congo in five years' time. Do not go now. But George Washington Williams was not hearing any of that. He was like, I'm sorry, I have to go now. And he went to the Congo. And what he saw? He was one of the first people to write to the world what he witnessed in Congo. He wrote an open letter to King Leopold that was published by the newspaper that sponsored his trip. The world read the atrocities going on in Congo. He did not sugarcoat anything. He said it as it was. This was slavery. This was slave trade. Thousands of hands were cut off. People were living in anguish. This place was hell. There was no hell anywhere else other than the Congo. The Congo was the hell that the Bible spoke about. He wrote this and it was published. And Leopold II panicked. He was scared at first. Everybody's going to find out about the atrocities going on there. This is not good for me. This is not good for Belgium. But then he remembered something very important. Something that was very important at that time. George Washington Williams was a black man. It was a black man's allegation against a white European king. So he knew that in time, the news would die down. Nobody would care. And it did. The news did die down. But not because George Washington Williams gave up. No, not long after his numerous publications, he fell ill. He was taken to England for treatment where he died. And the momentum of the story died with him. His work was not in vain. A few people got to hear about the story. And with other stories they were hearing from missionaries who were going and coming back from Congo, they were beginning to believe that something was wrong in Congo. Something was not adding up. And this was speaking interest in other journalists. People that had issues with Belgium, people that had issues with Europeans, were beginning to look at these stories and say, possibly there's some truth to this. I don't like this guy anyways. Two white men, Roger Casement and E.D. Morel, started writing stories about the horrors of Congo. People gradually began to believe these stories. Roger Casement and E.D. Morel had been to Congo. They spent time in Congo and they were writing from first-hand experience. They were getting interviews from missionaries. They were going to Congo to get these stories. They were finding pictures of amputated Congolese and they were publishing it. And people were beginning to believe in the United States. People were beginning to believe in Europe. And their contributions went a long way. Africans still were contributing in their own way. There was this young man, a Nigerian. His name was Hezekiah Andrew Shano. He could speak English and French. So he moved to Congo with his wife and kid and built this mega store there where he was selling to the locals and the first public. And everything was going on well for him. His business was doing well and he had no problems with the colonists there until he started witnessing the atrocities that were happening there firsthand. And this didn't sit well with him. And somehow he got in contact with Roger Casement and E.D. Morel and he started working for them. He was taking pictures of what was happening and sending these pictures to Roger Kespent and E.D. Morel, revealing more damning evidence of what was going on in the Congo. But unfortunately, he was found out. The first public found out he was leaking their secrets and they warned everyone not to carry out business with him. Nobody should go to his store to buy anything. Any Congolese found in his store carrying out any transactions would be dealt with. And he was targeted with abuses and threatening letters. And, and... Shortly after that, it was discovered that he took his own life. But it was not all bad because his contributions, the pictures he sent out to Europe, to America, that helped in publicizing the atrocities, these pictures, this evidence, touched a lot of hearts across the globe. And more journalists, more media companies were being inspired to focus more on these stories, to ask questions. So now, the pressure was coming from every angle on Leopold II. He needed to show the world that his hands were clean that all these accusations were just lies. So he set up an inquiry commission, a commission where investigations will be carried out in the Congo and the report will be published to the world on the discovery of this commission. Now, the choice of picking these three commissioners was very one-sided. Leopold personally picked people he felt would favor him. Of the three commissioners, we had one Belgian, one Swiss, and one Italian. 
He picked people that he felt would support an European like him, an European king, and not savages in Africa. And so the commission set out to investigate all these stories that were happening in the Congo. So these commissioners traveled across Congo, interviewing and investigating victims, administrators and missionaries there, asking what have you heard, what have you seen, what have you witnessed. If you're a Congolese and somebody cut off your arms, come and tell us what happened. Let us try and help you punish the evil force public officers that did this to you. And they carried out this inquiry. And after the inquiry was done, they had massive amount of reports, hundreds and hundreds of pages of testimonies from the locals, testimonies from missionaries, testimonies from first public officers themselves. And there was this man, Paul Costamans, the acting governor general. He read through the entire commission's findings. Two weeks later, after writing a series of farewell letters to his loved ones, he took a blade and ended his life. What he read about what was going on in the Congo was so horrible that he could not live with himself. He could not believe that he was associated with the people carrying this out. Even after all this, King Leopold was not interested in just letting Congo go. He knew the findings were bad and he knew things were not good for him. But he was not willing to let go of the Congo. He was hoping to wait it out. But luckily, the Americans who were the first to recognize Congo as a colony of King Leopold II started putting pressure on the Belgian government. Europeans too were putting pressure on the Belgian government. The Belgian government needed to act and they needed to act fast. So they approached Leopold II and said, we need to take this colony back from you. The, the news out there is not good. Leopold II said, no. It's my land. I'm not just going to hand it over to you. And this should make you understand how life was back then. The Belgian government had to buy Congo from Leopold II. They gave him money to hand over Congo to them. It was a transaction. He sold Congo back to the Belgian government. That was the only way he was taking his hands off. Even after everything that happened, somebody that should be tried for crimes, crimes against humanity, was being given money to hand over the colony. It is agreed that the population of Congo was reduced by half. The numbers are not agreed upon by everybody because different people have different agendas for why the number should be 10 million or 5 million or no casualties at all. But as they say, it's the victors that write the story. It's those that survive, that are alive, that write what happened, that write the stories that will be told for generations. And unfortunately for the Congo, even after Leopold's reign, the Belgian government took over. And of course, a few people in that administration are supporters of Leopold II. That's why he did so much damage in the first place. This is another dark story in the timeline, in the history of Africa. A story that we have to carry, a story we have to bear, a story we have to share. If you are still here, hit the like button, subscribe, and share. I would appreciate what you think about all this in the comment section below. Here is our first video on the atrocities that the Germans carried on Namibia. See you in our next story.